All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today, I'm happy to be introducing Dr. Louis Oziki. Uh, Louis received his PhD in 2002 from the University of York in the UK. His research focused on modeling the properties of standing ULF waves in the Earth's magnetosphere and how these waves can be generated by the ring current plasma population. Following his PhD, he moved to Canada to work at the University of Alberta, where he began studying wave-particle interactions, and in particular, the coupling of ULF waves with radiation belt electrons. He focused on ULF wave radial diffusion, developing both empirical and event-specific radial diffusion models, which utilize data from a range of global ground-based magnetometers in order to calculate the or in order to quantify the amplitude of radial diffusion coefficients, which could be used in radiation belt models. More recently, he has begun examining pitch angle distributions from the Van Allen probes mission. Currently, Lewis is project scientist for the recently selected Radicals mission, a spinning low Earth orbit spacecraft designed to measure energetic particle precipitation into the Earth's atmosphere and the waves which may be driving these particles into the lost cone. Uh, today, I'm happy to have Lewis here to discuss with us his recent work on electron pitch angle distributions observed during the Van Allen probe mission. Uh, with that, Lewis, if you'd like to take it away. Okay, can you hear me okay? Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that nice introduction, Kyle. So as Kyle just mentioned, I'm going to be talking about electron pitch angle distributions observed during the Van Allen probe mission. So as I'm sure everybody here is aware, the Van Allen probe mission consisted of two identical spacecraft passing through the inner and outer radiation belt, as shown in the schematic on the left here. So these are low inclination uh, spacecraft. And the key feature of these spacecraft that I'm gonna use or make use of in this presentation is that these spacecraft were spinning so that they were able to detect the full pitch angle distribution of particles. So there is two instruments that I'm going to be focused on, um, the REPT instrument and the MAGAIS instrument. And the plot on the right here illustrates some electron flux data from those two instruments. So the x-axis here is time, spanning a time interval of over four years. And the y-axis in each of these top panels, at least, is showing the L shell. And the color code here indicates the flux. So this is taken from a paper uh, by Zhao et al, JGR 2018. And you can clearly see that there's rapid increases in the flux as well as rapid decreases in the flux. So the purpose of looking at the pitch angle distributions and how they evolve during different storms is that by analyzing the pitch angle distributions, we're able to get some information on the possible acceleration and loss processes that are occurring in the magnetosphere. So as I mentioned, the motivation for examining these pitch angle distributions is that if you look at how the pitch angle distributions vary as a function of position, energy, geomagnetic activity, you can often get some important clues about what different processes may be occurring at the different um, locations responsible for the sudden loss and acceleration. So some of the commonly observed pitch angle distributions during the Van Allen probe mission are illustrated in the figure on the right here. So the x-axis in each of these panels is the equatorial pitch angles of the electrons in degrees, and the y-axis is simply the electron flux. So the top panel is showing an example of a commonly observed pitch angle distribution that's highly peaked at 90 degrees. This is sometimes referred to as a pancake pitch angle distribution. Panel B is showing a pitch angle distribution that remains relatively flat over a wide range of pitch angles, commonly referred to as a flat top pitch angle distribution. And panel C below that is showing a pitch angle distribution that's kind of shaped like a top hat. So it's often given the name of a top hat pitch angle distribution. So all of these three pitch angle distributions are generally have a flux that's peaked at 90 degrees. And the bottom two panels are showing butterfly pitch angle distributions known as um, uh, butterfly pitch angle distributions. So the key feature here for these two um, pitch angle distributions in the bottom 
is that the flux isn't peaked at 90 degrees, it's actually a minimum at 90 degrees. And what I'll show later in this seminar is that there are actually two different types of butterfly pitch angle distributions. One where the flux peaks at relatively low pitch angles, the other where the flux peaks not at 90 degrees, but at slightly higher pitch angles. So a brief outline of this seminar is I'll be talking first about these butterfly pitch angle distributions. So what are the possible causes? And what are the occurrence statistics and properties as observed during the Van Allen probe mission? And then I'll move on to looking at the non-butterfly pitch angle distributions, again, going over some of the possible causes as well as the occurrence statistics. And for the presentation, I'll be providing a range of different references um, for some of the causes of these um, different uh, butterfly and non-butterfly pitch angle distributions, as well as references to statistical studies um, based on Van Allen probe data on these pitch angle distributions. And then finally, I'll move on to showing some of the limitations of just using Van Allen probe data to analyze the different acceleration and loss processes that may be occurring and how to overcome these uh, limitations. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna start off by talking about how butterfly pitch angle distributions can be created. And one of the most well-known mechanisms is drift shell splitting combined with magnetopause shadowing. And the schematic here on the left kind of illustrates how this mechanism can create butterfly pitch angle distributions. So in this schematic, we're kind of looking down on the magnetosphere, kind of a bird's eye view of the magnetosphere. And the different colored lines here are showing the drift trajectories of electrons starting off, the, starting off at the same point at midnight in the nighttime sector and moving around. The dark red here is showing the, the drift trajectory of an electron that has an equatorial pitch angle of 90 degrees. And then the dark blue is the same trajectory, but for a pitch angle uh, that has a pitch angle of 15 degrees. So for an electron, which, have a, which has an equatorial pitch angle of 15 degrees. And the key feature here in this figure is that um, the drift trajectories are not circular, but the electrons with very low pitch angles actually move out to greater radial distances on the day side uh, compared to the trajectories of the electrons, which have much lower pitch angles. This process is known as drift shell splitting, and it's the result of the conservation of the first and second adiabatic invariants of the electrons when the day side magnetosphere is compressed. So if the magnetosphere is compressed so that the magnetic field on the day side is higher than that on the night side at the same radial distance, then you end up with these splitting of the pitch angle uh, trajectories. And this solid line here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, yeah, here represents the location of the magnetopause. So what can happen is if the magnetopause moves inwards during one of these compressions, then the magnetopause position can actually intersect some of these trajectories. And if it intersects only the trajectories of the electrons that have high pitch angles, what can happen is that when it does, when the magnetopause intersects these trajectories, these electrons end up being lost. They leave the magnetosphere. So all of the electrons with very high pitch angles end up being lost. And the only particles that are remaining have very low pitch angles. So these will be detected in this MLT sector by spacecrafts, which is the Van Allen probes, uh, whereas the high pitch angle electrons won't be detected, resulting in a loss. So that's one way in which this type of butterfly pitch angle distribution can be created. So again, when the pitch angles, uh, the electrons with pitch angles of around 90 degrees are lost, this will produce a dip in the flux, resulting in this butterfly shaped uh, pitch angle distribution. So in general, this process should occur on higher L shells because that's where the trajectories are most likely to uh, intersect the magnetopause. And the resulting butterfly pitch angle distributions are more likely to be observed um, between around 18 MLT and um, midnight by spacecraft on these high L shells. Again, this effect is most likely to occur during geomagnetically active times when the magnetosphere is compressed uh, on the day side and the magnetopause moves inwards to lower L shells, which can intersect the trajectories. So this mechanism is, is not particularly new. 
And the earliest reference to it that I found, at least, was in a paper by West et al. in Nature Physics, 1972. And then a follow-on paper by the same uh, authors in JGR in 1973. I should also point out, especially since I think he's attending this meeting, is that there's a very nice paper by Seibeck et al., uh, JGR, that kind of illustrates that depending on the flux as a function of L shell of the injected particles, this process of drift shell splitting can actually create a range of different pitch angle distributions at different MLTs. So more recently, a lot of work has been done on this loss process and how it can be rapidly enhanced with outward radial diffusion. So I think the A, this process of outward radial diffusion um, of the electrons enhancing the loss to the magnetopause was first proposed by Spritz et al. There's been several other papers on this, such as the Turner et al. Nature Physics paper, as well as an ICE paper by Loto Anu et al. in JGR from 2010. So that's how butterfly pitch angle distributions can be created by drift shell splitting in combination with magnetopause shadowing. But that's not the only mechanism oops, that's been proposed to explain these butterfly pitch angle distributions. Fast acceleration by magnetosonic waves has also been proposed as a potential uh, mechanism that can create these butterfly pitch angle distributions. And the schematic here on the right is illustrating results from a paper by Xiao et al. that's been published in Nature Comms back in 2016. So the top two panels here are showing the time evolution, so from panel A to panel B, of the pitch angle distributions. And you can see that not only is the flux, um, a butterfly pitch angle distribution being created, but it's been created at higher flux for all of these different energies. So that's not entirely consistent with what you would expect with magnetopause shadowing since the flux has actually gone up. So it's actually been enhanced. And in this paper, they show some nice simulation results showing how this butterfly pitch angle distribution can be recreated during this event uh, by parallel acceleration with magnetosonic waves at a range of energies from two MeV shown here all the way up to 3.6 MeV shown by the black curve. So one potential criticism of this is that it's actually occurs on a very high L shell. So maybe magnetopause shadowing is actually occurring. Maybe these particles are actually accelerated upwards um, without producing a butterfly pitch angle distribution. And then maybe there's a bit of magnetopause shadowing loss occurring at the same time, which would reduce the flux here. So maybe there's rapid acceleration and then um, some magnetopause shadowing contributing to this uh, butterfly pitch angle distribution. However, there are also similar observations at much lower L shells. So there's a paper by Lee et al, JGR from 2016, where they show similar butterfly pitch angle distributions with enhanced flux, but at very low L shells. So I think they have L star of three. So that's much less likely to be related to magnetopause shadowing. And I'll show some results from that Lee et al paper next. So here's some results from the Lee et al, JGR from 2016. Again, this is an L star of three, and all of these different energies from 1.8 MeV, um, sh shown by the black curve, all the way up to 5.2 MeV. The flux is both enhanced during this uh, particular storm, as well as the creation of a butterfly pitch angle distribution. So I should also mention that in this paper, they also show that this, enhanced flux butterfly pitch angle distribution is entirely consistent with acceleration by magnetosonic waves. And finally, there's another observation of the growing uh, flux butterfly pitch angle distribution in this paper by Neatel, also at a very low L shell, so around L of 3.6. So that's also not really consistent with magnetopause shadowing down to the, such a low L shell. Um, but yeah, the flux is also enhanced as well over a very, very short time scale. So all of these events seem to indicate that you can get butterfly pitch angle distributions with enhanced flux, not consistent with magnetopause shadowing. So what about the statistical studies of these butterfly pitch angle distributions? So that's what I'm gonna talk about next. 
So if you want to actually use Van Allen probe data to determine the flux as a function of equatorial pitch angle, you need to know what the equatorial pitch angle is instead of the local pitch angle measured by the spacecraft. So one very simple approach you can use to determine the equatorial pitch angles is just to use data from the Van Allen probes when the probes are very close or when the probes are at very low magnetic inclinations. And that's been done in the paper by Neatel, GRL 2016, and my recently published uh, JGR. So again, this is just selecting data when the inclination of the spacecraft is at very low magnetic inclination. And I've underlined magnetic here because obviously there can be a significant difference between the geographic and uh, magnetic uh, inclination. You can improve on that technique by actually mapping the pitch angles measured, uh, the local pitch angles measured at the position of the spacecraft to the equatorial pitch angles. And you do that by assuming the first adiabatic invariant of the electrons is conserved. That was done in the paper by Zhao et al, JGR 2018, as well as um, my paper as well from 2020. So if you do that, you're able to get the equatorial pitch angles at a discrete set of uh, pitch angles. And that's what's shown in the figure on the right here for two different butterfly pitch angle distributions. So instead of just having a simple set of discrete points where you know what the flux is at the discrete pitch angles, you can do better than that by fitting this data uh, to a whole range of different um, uh, fitting parameters. And the one I'm gonna look at is uh, fitting based on Legendre polynom polynomials. And um, that was perhaps not first done, but it was done in a heavily cited paper by Chen et al, uh, JGR 2014, where they developed this REPAD model uh, for the pitch angle distributions based on fits. And it was also done in a, a later paper by Zhao et al, where they actually used Van Allen probe data um, using the same polynomial uh, fitting process. So if you, if you apply those fits to the data, so this is what you end up with. This is the black curve here showing the fits to this data. And the nice thing about using these fits is you can actually determine much more accurately a whole bunch of parameters. So you can determine the pitch angle where the flux is at a minimum more accurately than using the data at the discrete points. And you can also determine the, flux, uh, the pitch angle where the flux reaches a peak as well. And then you can calculate parameters like the dip size for these butterfly pitch angle distributions. So the dip size is just simply the difference between the peak flux and the minimum flux. So in the statistical studies that I'm gonna go through next, basically the shape of these pitch angle distributions uh, has been characterized and been analyzed as a function of energy, location, and geomagnetic activity using different bin sizes for L-shell, MLT, and um, geomagnetic activity. So I think one of the, the key results basically based on the butterfly pitch angle distributions is, is illustrated in this figure here. And this is showing that there appears to be two distinct populations of butterfly pitch angle distributions. One where the peak, where the flux peaks at 65 degrees roughly, and the other where the flux peaks at around 35 degrees. So in this figure here, the x-axis is showing the equatorial pitch angle for these butterfly pitch angle distributions where the flux reaches a peak. And the y-axis here is showing the percentage of these butterfly pitch angle distributions that have their flux peak at that given pitch angle. So just to understand this uh, result a bit more clearly, if you just focus on this panel here, so this is results for L star of three or results in the L star of three bin, the DST of minus 60, you can see that the vast majority of the butterfly pitch angle distributions have a flux which peaks at 65 degrees, an, an equatorial pitch angle of 65 degrees. However, when you move on to higher L shells, so this is results at the bottom here, hope you can see my cursor at L star of five. So this is the, if you can't see my cursor, this is the results in the bottom left-hand panel, L star of five. So here you can see that almost all of the butterfly pitch angle distributions that are observed have a flux that peaks at 35 degrees. And this occurs across the whole range of energies, all the way down to 
0.2 MeV all the way up to 3.4 MeV. So we believe that for this population here that occurs on high L shells and generally during more geomagnetically active times, that this is primarily due to the process of drift shell splitting in combination with magnetopause shadowing, since it occurs on the high L shells and also occurs more during geomagnetically active times. So one outstanding question that at least I don't know the answer to is, why is there a peak at 35 degrees and not at another pitch angle? So that's an interesting question that we really don't know the answer to, at least not yet. So the other population of butterfly pitch angle distributions that has a flux peak at 65 degrees that occurs on the lower L shells, again, during more geomagnetically active times, um, is we believe that this population is related to uh, local acceleration. And I'll go through later some of the reasons why it's believed that this population is due to a local acceleration or could be due to local acceleration. So we can also look at the actual distribution of these butterfly pitch angle distributions as a function of both L star as well as MLT to see if that's consistent uh, with these processes. So the results shown in the panel on the right here, in the panels on the right here, are just for the butterfly pitch angle distributions that have a flux that peaks at 35 degrees. So as I hope you can see, the vast majority of these butterfly pitch angle distributions are detected A, during more geomagnetically active times. There are B, also detected between, or predominantly between 1800 MLT and 2400 MLT. So in the dusk to midnight sector. And they're also detected at higher L shells. So all of these three features are consistent with what you would expect um, via loss due to magnetopause shadowing combined with drift shell splitting. And I'll just jump back to my original schematic showing that this is the location in MLT here where the spacecraft is, where you would expect to detect most of these uh, butterfly pitch angle distributions. And based on our statistics, that's exactly where they occur. So the observations of this uh, particular population of butterfly pitch angle distributions that peaks at 35 degrees appear consistent with the processes of magnetopause shadowing and drift shell splitting. And I should point out that these results are taken from my GRL, but there are similar results also published in the nice paper by Ni um, et al, uh, GRL. And the GR in the in the paper by Nietzsche, they only used rep data without any uh, Legendre polynomial fitting. There's also similar results in the Zhao et al. Uh, JGR, um, where they did apply fitting based on Legendre polynomials, and they had uh, around four years of data from the Rept and Magais uh, instruments. And again, this data here is just taken from my uh, uh, recent JGR. So what about the other population of butterfly pitch angle uh, distributions that where the flux peaks at 65 degrees? So the occurrence statistics of the, that population is shown here in a similar format and at similar energies. So here, hopefully you can see that these are occurring over a much uh, wider range of L shells and ML MLTs, but they're also generally more of them during more active times. So you can see that there's more red dots here at DST of minus 60 and the column of data on the left compared to the DST of zero bin shown in the column on the right here. So they seem to occur basically across a much wider range of MLTs, um, a much wider range of L shells, even on low L shells, and again, generally during more active times. So the main reason why we think that this could be potentially associated with local acceleration or these, this population of butterfly pitch angle distributions is uh, likely due to local acceleration is because there's a whole range of different papers that have shown that uh, local acceleration can be most efficient for electrons with equatorial pitch angles around 60 uh, degrees. So that's been shown on low L shells in a paper by Albert et al, the JGR from 2016. 
It was shown um, in a paper by Horn et al. Where they looked at acceleration by magnetosonic waves. That's from a GRL from 20, uh, 2007. And the, interestingly, there's also a paper by Umama et al., uh, JGR from 2015, where they showed that nonlinear acceleration by chorus waves could also create butterfly pitch angle distributions that have their peak at equatorial pitch angles of around 60 degrees. And I'll show some of those results from these papers next. So here's some of the results taken from the paper by Horn et al., the GRL from 2007. So the x-axis here is showing the equatorial pitch angle, and the y-axis here is showing the energy diffusion coefficients due to acceleration via magnetosonic waves. And as you can see, at a range of different energies, so from 0.1 to 3 MeV, this acceleration process appears to be most efficient, kind of reaching a peak at equatorial pitch angles from around 50 to around 70 degrees, slightly dependent on energy. So that, again, that's uh, some evidence that perhaps this population of butterfly pitch angle distributions could be due uh, to acceleration by magnetosonic waves. Uh, the schematic of the figure on the right here is taken directly from a nice paper by Umama uh, et al, uh, GRL from 2015. And this is showing the nonlinear acceleration by chorus waves of electrons. So if you just look at these panels here on the left, the x-axis is kinetic energy of the electrons, and the y-axis here is the equatorial pitch angles. So if you start off with a completely flat distribution, it's the same across all pitch angles, then after roughly 10 wave cycles, you can see that it begins to peak at around 60 degrees as the particles are accelerated from low energy to high energy. After 30 cycles, that peak becomes much clearer, even at higher energies, as shown in the next schematic, so B, which results after 30 uh, cycles of wave particle interactions. And then here in uh, panel C, it's showing acceleration or after 20 wave uh, particle interactions, showing a, even a, a, a peak at energies all the way up to uh, over four or MeV here in the flux. So this is kind of indicating that uh, this nonlinear acceleration may in theory at least be able to accelerate um, the electrons preferentially at pitch angles of around 60 degrees, producing these butterfly uh, pitch angle distributions. So what are the key results that we have based on observations and models of uh, butterfly pitch angle distributions? So I think that the key result is that there are two distinct and discrete populations of butterfly pitch angle distributions. One that has a flux peak around 35 degrees that appears consistent with the process of magnetopause shadowing combined with drift shell splitting. The other population of butterfly pitch angle distribution um, has a flux peak at an equatorial pitch angle of around 65 degrees. Uh, this could, uh, based on the, 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 the theory uh, that I just showed, could be due to acceleration uh, of the electrons preferentially at this pitch angle by either magnetosonic waves or perhaps also by uh, nonlinear acceleration by the chorus waves. Obviously, there may be other processes that are occurring um, that are creating these butterfly pitch angle distributions, but it appears that the, the probably two most likely ones are um, magnetopause shadowing and local acceleration. So that's what I based uh, most of my results on. Now, the vast majority of pitch angle distributions that are observed in the magnetosphere are not butterfly, but are non-butterfly. So I'm gonna go on to talk about those um, but, uh, non-butterfly pitch angle distributions next. So here's an example of a highly peaked um, non-butterfly pitch angle distribution, so highly peaked at pitch angles near 90 degrees, where the flux is much lower at the lower pitch angles here. So one possible mechanism that may create these kind of highly peaked pitch angle distributions, peaked at 90 degrees and much lower at the lower pitch angles, is scattering by electromagnetic ion sunk, uh, cyclotron waves. So these, these waves can typically resonate with electrons with energies 
greater than around one MeV. And they're much more efficient at scattering the low pitch angle particles uh, than pitch angles at higher, uh, than higher pitch angle electrons into the lost cone. I'm not sure if this is the first paper, but it's the L East paper that I saw by Thorne and Kennel, where they uh, discussed this mechanism. So a JGR from 1971. But there's also some very nice results in this paper by Usanova et al, uh, uh, GRL um, from 2014, uh, based on Van Allen probe observations, as well as ground-based magnetometer observations of the emit waves and showing, that it, uh, showing um, emit wave diffusion coefficients um, that produce results consistent with the uh, observed flux at different energies. Obviously, there are other waves that can scatter electrons. There's chorus waves can also scatter electrons. So these generally scatter lower energy electrons than the, than the, than the emit waves, but they're able to scatter electrons over a much broader range of equatorial pitch angles into the atmosphere. And there's a whole range of papers that have shown this. I've just picked out several here. So there's a nice paper by Summers et al, JGR from 2007. There's also a Horn and Glauert paper showing the energy and pitch angle dependence of scattering by these chorus waves from JGR 2005. There's also a nice uh, more recent GRL from Yang et al uh, from 2016, where they actually show that this rapid scattering from chorus waves can actually flatten the pitch angle distributions, even completely removing butterfly pitch angle distributions and making them completely flat. So one of the other waves that's commonly associated with scattering um, inside the plasma sphere is plasmospheric Hiss waves. And again, pitch angle diffusions due to these waves are shown in the Summers paper. And there's also some nice observations or a case study observation in the paper by Ripple et al, so JGR from 2018, where they show that these plasmospheric Hiss waves are actually able to rapidly scatter the low pitch angle, low energy electrons uh, on low L shells uh, into the loss cone, creating these kind of top hat uh, pitch angle distributions. And they show some nice simulation and observation results in this paper. So here's some of the pitch angle diffusion coefficients due to plasmospheric Hiss uh, waves taken from the Ripple et al paper. Again, this was a case study, so it's just uh, uh, over a number of days. So the x-axis here in each of these panels is showing your equatorial pitch angle, and the y-axis here is showing the energy of the electrons, and each different panel is at different energies. And the key features here are that, um, first of all, the pitch angle scattering rates indicated by the color scale here are much faster for the lower pitch angle electrons, and also for electrons at much lower energies. And that's shown on a whole range of different L-shells here for the two different uh, time intervals examined in this case study. So what about the EMIC waves? Well, here's some results from the Usanova et al, uh, GRL from 2014. Oops. So the X axis here is showing the diffusion coefficient in each of these panels on the left. And the Y axis here is showing the equatorial pitch angle. And one of the, 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 uh, the key feature here is that as you move upwards in energy, I mean, you, all of these energies are pretty high, they're all ultra relativistic energies, but as you move upwards in energy, uh, the scattering actually is able to remove um, higher and higher uh, pitch angle electrons. And again, these scattering rates were derived from the in-situ and ground-based magnetometer observations of the emit waves. And this, these observations of the scattering rates completely matches uh, simultaneous in situ observations of the pitch angle distributions as shown in the panels on the right here. So again, this is time on the x-axis and pitch angle on the y-axis here, and the color score is indicating the flux. And as I hope you can see, as you move upwards in energy, so from, I don't know, is it, is, is it uh, oops, can't see at the top of my screen. I think it's just over 2 MeV at the top, all the way um, up to you know, 7 MeV at the bottom, the pitch angle distribution becomes gradually narrower uh, completely matching the rapid pitch angle uh, scattering, even of the higher pitch angle electrons at uh, higher energies. So here, this is kind of nice observations that the emic scattering waves completely match the in situ observations of the pitch angle distributions where more electrons are lost at the higher energies 
uh, and, the, and at the higher pitch angles, producing these narrower pitch angle distributions at the higher energies. So what about observations of the pitch angle distributions based on the statistical studies um, from the Van Allen probes? So that's what's shown here in the panel on the right. So this is results that I've put together, basically taken from uh, a paper that I'm, I have in preparation, and it's showing normalized pitch angle distributions. So here I've tried to quantify the flatness of the pitch angle distributions and then rank order the flatness. So the method I've used to quantify the flatness is basically I've taken um, the mean of the normalized flux over all pitch angles. So you could imagine a completely flat pitch angle distribution um, that would have a, a, a mean normalized flux of one. So the flux would just be equal to one at all the pitch angles. So the mean of that normalized flux would be one for a completely flat. And you can also imagine a highly peaked pitch angle distribution where the flux is completely flat and then goes to a value of one at 90 degrees and then drops again back down to zero at the higher pitch angles. So the, the mean of that normalized flux will be very low. So for each, for all of the pitch angle distributions that are observed in each L star bin and, and each DST value are able to rank order their flatness based on that criteria. And that's what's shown in each of these panels here. So the red curve here is showing uh, the least flattest, uh, at least the bottom quartile flattest pitch angle distribution. The blue curve here is showing the upper quartile uh, flattest distribution. And the black curve here is showing the medium. So it's just giving you an indication of how the flatness of the pitch angle distributions varies on a fixed L star and a fixed DST. So two key features of this plot are the, the flatness of the pitch angle distribution varies with both L star and energy. So if you look at the panel in the top left here, showing results um, at low L shells and high energies, as you move to lower and lower energies, the pitch angle distributions become gradually more and more peaked on these low L shells. So that's shown here as you move downwards, the pitch angle distributions become more and more peaked at lower energies. However, the opposite is true on at high L shells. So here is his results in the, the L star of five bin. So here, if you start at high energy and you move to gradually lower and lower energies, instead of becoming uh, more peaked, the pitch angle distributions become gradually flatter and flatter as you move to lower and lower energies. So you're getting completely opposite behavior on low, uh, L shells than you are on high L shells and how the uh, flatness depends on energy. Another interesting feature of, um, of this panel is that there's not much difference on a fixed L star and a fixed energy in, in, in a fixed DST on the flatness. So the pitch angle distribution seems to remain kind of remarkably similar uh, uh, at a similar point and for a similar level of geomagnetic activity. Well, there's not much difference between the upper and lower quartiles in terms of flatness. So the shape of these pitch angle distributions is also very self-similar. I don't have it here, but I have it in the, one of my extra figures. I actually have a figure showing that this flatness is maintained even as the flux of this self-similarity of the pitch angle distribution is maintained, even as the flux can var varies by you know, four orders of magnitude. So again, as I mentioned, on low L shells, the pitch angle distributions are flatter at higher energies, but on high L shells, the pitch angle distributions are flatter uh, at low energies. So just, uh, again, these results are just taken from the work that I'm kind of currently preparing for JGR. And they're, they're summarized here, as well as the potential causes for this behavior on different uh, L stars. So again, this top panel here is showing results uh, for taking an L star of four. It's, I'm just showing the mediums here rather than the quartiles, both at low uh, energy, so 0.2 MeV in red, showing the highly peaked pitch angle distribution, and then at high energy, showing a much flatter pitch angle distribution on low L shells here. So a potential explanation for this um, energy dependence on low L shells is that 
these pitch angle distributions, so the flattening of the low energy pitch angle distribution, not the flattening, I should say, the more peaked pitch angle distributions at low energy is actually due to scattering by Hiss waves, which are able to resonate and scatter the low pitch angles electrons at low energies, producing a much more peaked pitch angle distribution um, on these low L shells. Entirely consistent with the observations and simulations uh, presented in the paper by Ripple et al., so GGR from 2018. And similar observations were also made in the uh, paper by Zhao et al., so GGR uh, 2018. So on the high L shells, the behavior is opposite. So on the high L shells, it's actually the higher energy uh, electrons that uh, have a much more peaked pitch angle distributions. So this could be due to scattering of these high energy electrons uh, with uh, by magneto uh, by EMIC waves. So again, the EMIC waves are able to scatter the low pitch angle electrons into the loss cone, producing these much more peaked uh, pitch angle distributions at the higher energies. And again, that's also consistent with other observational studies uh, in Zhao et al. And also there's a nice paper by Drozdov um, et al, JGR from 2020, where they show that if you combine the emic scattering with scattering due to other waves like chorus and hiss, then you're able to not only reduce the flux of the low pitch angle electrons, but even the flux of um, electrons with much higher pitch angles close to 90 degrees. So all of the results that I'm showing here on, in the schematic on the right are just for DST of minus 30 nanoteslas. But they do, there is similar results uh, at other, uh, in other DST bins. But next I wanna show some results from a paper by Grayley et al, where they actually look at the evolution in the pitch angle distributions uh, during storms. So again, this is just focusing on these non-butterfly pitch angle distributions where the flux is peaked at 90 degrees. Instead of using Legendre polynomials to fit to the data, uh, for these particular butterfly, uh, non-butterfly pitch angle distributions, you can actually fit the data to a much simpler functional form, simply sine to the n of the equatorial pitch angle. And that's what's being done for the reps data shown in the figures on the right here. And the key feature to note is that the larger the value of n for these fits, the more peaked the pitch angle distribution is. So in the study by uh, Grayley et al, they actually looked at 20 CME storms and 23 CRI driven storms. And they did some superposed epoch analysis to look at the, the temporal evolution and the pitch angle distribution during the storms. So the different colors here are just showing different energies and the solid line in the middle is showing the medium based on this uh, superposed epoch analysis. And then the, the lighter shades are just showing uh, one and two sigma deviations from the medium. But yeah, the key features here to know are that if you look at the days from DST on the x-axis uh, and then the value of n indicating how peaked the pitch angle distribution is, you can see that it's roughly around one day after DST minimum when the pitch angle distributions become most peaked in general. So pre-storm, not so peaked during the storm, they become peaked and it's roughly one day after DST minimum when the pitch angle distributions become most peaked and then they gradually become less and less peaked during the recovery phase. So the key results um, from these statistical studies and uh, models based on the observations of non-butterfly pitch angle distributions is that the, pitch angle, the shape of the pitch angle distribution seems very similar at a fixed energy uh, L shell and DST. However, once you go on to high L shells, the, the butterfly pitch angle distributions become uh, gradually uh, more peaked at higher energies. And we believe that this is due to rapid scattering of these high energy electrons, which are able to resonate with emit waves, uh, at least low, uh, low pitch angle electrons, and scatter them into the, uh, uh, to the loss cone, producing these kind of highly peaked uh, pitch angle distributions on the higher L shells. Now for the low L shells, we see that the butterfly, uh, the non-butterfly pitch angle distributions are much more peaked at lower energies. And the, the reason for this is that we believe that this is due to scattering of these low pitch angle, low energy electrons 
into the loss cone by plasmospheric Hiss waves, producing much more peaked pitch angle distributions at the lower energies. And then finally, we showed how the pitch angle distributions evolve during storms. Uh, with REPS data showing uh, that the pitch angle dist distributions become more peaked at approximately one day after the DST has reached a minimum value, based on the superposed epoch analysis shown in the paper by Grayley et al. So what are the limitations of just looking at Van Allen probe data? Well, one of the issues is that the Van Allen probe data, because of the low inclination, it can't resolve the particles that are actually in the loss cone. So you don't really know how many particles or what the flux is of particles that are actually being lost to the atmosphere as they're scattered into the atmosphere by all of these different waves. So that's kind of illustrated in, in the top panel here. So the x-axis here is showing L shell and this solid curve is showing um, the size of the loss cone in terms of the equatorial pitch angle. And you can see that if you're right in the heart of the outer radiation belt shown by this um, vertical solid line, so if you're at like 4.5 L, the loss cone is actually less than five degrees and neither the REPT or the MAGICE instrument can resolve pitch angles less than five degrees. So you can't detect the particles that are in the loss cone in the heart of the outer belt. However, if you have a LEO orbiting spacecraft at an altitude of 800 kilometers, then the loss cone becomes much, much larger. So that's what's shown in the bottom panel here. So again, the x-axis is L-shell, and then the y-axis here is showing the loss cone uh, for a LEO uh, polar orbiting spacecraft at 800 kilometers. So here, right in the heart of the, the outer belt at 4.5 uh, L-shell, the loss cone is now opened up to around 58.5 degrees. So if you're taking measurements at LEO, you can easily resolve the particles both in and out of the loss uh, uh, cone. And there's a whole bunch of papers that have, that, have, that have used this approach of using LEO orbiting spacecraft to detect the flux uh, of particles in the loss cone. So there's some nice uh, papers by Rogers uh, et al, uh, GRL from 2010, where they show that this uh, can be done using POSE data. So POSE basically has two uh, telescopes, one looking radially. So if you're on high L shells, it's or in the outer radiation belt, you're essentially just looking down the field line. So these are able, this particular telescope, the zero degree telescope is able to detect these particles that are in the loss cone. And there's also a perpendicular telescope, um, which can measure kind of a combination of particles that are trapped in the drift loss cone and in the bounce loss cone, depending on the um, location of the uh, spacecraft. So recently there's been a new mission launched called ELFIN, which is a low altitude uh, uh, polar orbiting uh, spacecrafts um, that are spinning. So they, these spinning spacecraft are able to detect both particles inside and outside the lost count and also resolve the full pitch angle distribution. So I'd like to show some results from, uh, at least the first results from the ELFIN mission. So this is a, from a nice paper by Marana Sattel, uh, JGR from 2021, showing some of the first results from ELFIN. And here I've just kind of focused on what I find most interesting about these results is the significant amount of backscatter. So the x-axis here is just showing time. And then the y-axis in each of these panels is showing the, uh, the, the, the pitch angle. And then the color scale is showing the flux. And this dotted line here right in the center is showing um, results for a pitch angle of 90 degrees. And then above that is showing the backscattered flux. And then below that is showing the precipitating flux. And as I hope you can see, I mean, even observed at both spacecraft, there's a significant amount of flux that's actually backscattered. Uh, the top panels here are showing results from 50 keV all the way up to 150 keV, showing the same effect that, there's a, that there is a significant amount of particles that are not come, just come lost as they're precipitating down, but they're actually become backscattered. And that's also shown even at higher energies. So the bottom two panels are results from the two spacecraft at 0 0.35 MeV to one MeV. And again, showing a significant amount of particles are actually backscattered. So if you were just using say data from the post spacecraft that's just measuring the particles coming down the field line and you didn't have any idea of what the backscattered flux was, 
you may overestimate the amount of particles that are being lost and precipitated into the atmosphere, since a significant fraction of those actually become backscattered. So uh, anyway, I, I found that interesting. So finally, I'm going to conclude here and just talk about the upcoming mission where we're going to do something similar. And we're also going to be using a polar orbiting low altitude spacecraft to measure the flux distributions, both in both trapped and precipitating. Uh, this is a single spacecraft mission, uh, and this is the payload here. So we have a high energy particle telescope instrument known as HEPT, um, developed at the U of A. And this is capable of, capable of measuring both protons and electrons uh, from tens of keV up to multiple MeV. So we also have both search coil magnetometers as well as fluxgate magnetometers. So we're able to take in situ measurements of all of the waves that are responsible for the precipitation of these particles into the uh, lost cone and ultimately into the atmosphere. So I should point out that the search call is going to measure waves all the way up to around 35 keV. So it should be able to measure the waves even from these BLF transmitters that have been proposed as a potential loss mechanism uh, for electrons, particularly uh, ultra relativistic energies on low L shells. Uh, finally, the instrument uh, payload also consists of an X-ray uh, imager. So this imager will measure the um, X-rays coming from the, the Bram Spralong electrons as they slow down and are backscattered. So we'll be able to get information on what the flux is and the energy distribution of these electrons as they are uh, lost into the atmosphere. And the panels uh, on the right here show a schematic of the uh, spinning spacecraft. It's a, it's a Thomson spinner. So it's kind of just like a, a cartwheel. So the spin uh, plane is in the same direction that the spacecraft is moving. And hopefully we'll want to be able to resolve uh, the evolution of the flux as it goes from an empty loss cone to a filled loss cone uh, during strong um, diffusion events. Okay, and I think I'll leave it there. I'm not sure how I'm doing this time. Okay, around 50, that's good. All right, thank you, Lewis, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a few questions uh, that we can start off with. Um, the first is from Christine Sigsby, and it's regarding your figure on slide one. Um, is that figure available or published? Um, she's been looking for one recently that clearly defines the different pitch angle distributions. Yeah, this is just pulled out of my 20, 22 uh, JGR. So that figure should be available. Oh, okay, excellent, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Eric Lund, which I believe is also on this page. Um, are you classifying cigar distributions as an extreme version of butterfly distributions then? No, that's a great question. I, I completely ignored cigar distributions. I didn't count them as either a butterfly or non-butterfly. But that's something I could look into, and it's probably an interesting uh, topic to look into. But no, I didn't include any cigar butterfly pitch angle distributions in the uh, studies that I've presented today. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a quick comment from George. Uh, he knew Harry West, and he's glad to see that you've mentioned his results here. Yeah, well, um, I think you should get credit for being the first guy to come up with this mechanism, if that truly is the case of uh, magnetopore shadowing loss. Wow. Yeah, and it's been a pretty big topic of study with Van Allen probes. So Yeah, yeah. I don't see his paper cited um, always when people are talking about these butterfly pitch angle distributions related to magnetopause shadowing. So. Um, so Jerry Manweiler has a comment uh, regarding the pitch angle distributions. Um, one element he didn't see a discussion uh, about was gyro phase and how it relates to the various pitch angle distributions. Um, as they can play a role depending on the nature of the process and shouldn't be excluded. Um, for instance, uh, there's pitch angle, there is pitch angle splitting due to magnetopause compression. Uh, the specific phase angle is the reason that the dip at 90 degrees doesn't go completely to zero in the flux. Okay, that's something I wasn't aware of. I mean, my background is not really in resonant interactions with these BLF waves. I'm more of a ULF wave guy. So I, there is gaps in my knowledge when it comes to the, the intricate details of some of these wave particle interactions. 
Um, so we have a question from Katie Wang. Are there very few cigar distributions or beam-like distributions for the energy ranges discussed here? Um, you briefly touched on this. Yeah. Um, it looks, oh, sorry. <laughs> it looks that the like the pancake, flat top, and butterfly distributions dominate. Uh, could this be related to larger loss cone sizes at the range of L shells discussed? Yeah, I, I don't really want to comment on this distributions of these cigar shaped distributions since I haven't looked at them. So I, those have been excluded from this study as, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, so Jerry has one more comment. Uh, the RB spice instrument can go down to approximately a uh, loss cone of about 7.5 degrees in some cases. Okay. Uh, so Jason Durr is wondering if you've looked at the pitch angle distributions and how they evolve during substorms. Um, do substorms affect the electron pitch angle distributions and have you looked at that at all? Not explicitly, but I agree that substorms will af affect the pitch angle distributions. I mean, as I kind of alluded to earlier on, there is a paper by, um, let me go back to this figure here. So there is a paper by Cybeck where they look at different distributions of injected particles and how that if depending on how that flux of these injected particles varies with L shells it can result in a whole range of different um uh pitch angle distributions at different MLT locations due to drift shell splitting so I'm aware of how that can happen but I, I haven't looked into it and I haven't really done any detailed analysis of that oh, okay um, so Elizaveta has a question, um, which is also something I am curious about. Um, do you see a difference between pitch angle distributions during the storm main phase and the storm recovery phase? Um, in the distributions, do you see, um, say, a peak in um, butterfly distributions during the main phase and a peak in peaked distributions during the recovery phase, or are they all kind of muddled together? Yeah, so in my statistics, I mean, I did just look at kind of DST bins. So they were, as you say, like muddled, um, muddled together. So I just basically looked at certain DST bins. But I did show some results from the from the Grayley paper showing the temporal evolution of these distributions during storms. And I'll just try and pull up that figure here. Yeah. So here, this is kind of showing how they evolve temporally using superposed epoch analysis during different storms. Again, this is just for the non-butterfly uh, pitch angle distributions. Yeah. Yeah. I think what could be interesting is looking at the relative distribution of your pitch of your butterfly versus peak in the same format here to see if you see butterfly more during the main phase when you expect shadowing than during the recovery phase. Yeah. So um, as you may be aware, the Sam Walton is actually looking at this. So he's doing some superposed epoch analysis uh, based on the Legendre polynomials. So similar to this analysis, but based on the genre polynomials. So you could look at the superposed epoch analysis of the butterfly and non-butterfly pitch angle distributions using that approach and see how they evolve during storms. Ah, cool. That's, that paper has been submitted and I think it's under review now. Oh, okay. Um, so our last question in the chat comes from Dave Pitchford. Uh, he's curious, is Radicals funded? And if so, when is the expected launch for Radicals? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I'm kind of happy to announce that Radicals is, is fully funded. As for the expected launch date, I mean, you're probably best to contact the PI, Ian Mann, but um, well, I think we're hoping to have a launch date of around 2025. So it's gonna coincide with Solar Max. So there should be a, a lot of interesting events at that time. But again, it's kind of up in the air. It depends on the launch provider. These things can easily be delayed several years uh, based on other missions. So yeah, mm -hmm. don't quote me, but um, hopefully 2025. Excellent. Well, congratulations on that. Um, so I have a final question, uh, which is one for me. Uh, you looked at the pitch angle distributions as a function of L star, um, but David Malasapina has a really cool GRL, which shows the occurrence of different types of waves relative to the plasma pause, especially for the high frequency waves with Van Allen probes. Um, have you looked at these distributions and their distance and how the distributions vary? relative to their distance from the plasma pause as opposed to just L-star? No, the, the short answer is no. But yeah, I think that that's an important parameter actually. So where exactly the plasma pause is? Because my studies are basically statistical studies. 
So I have looked at how it's related to the statistical position of the magnetopause, but not really. Um, so statistically, the magnetopause is obviously on low L shells. So, and you can look at some of the models, uh, like the you know O'Brien and Muldrin magnetopause. Um, oh, sorry, I mean the plasma pause. Oh, plasma pause. Yeah, ones. sorry. I, I mean the there's no. I think there are several plasma pause models. And I yeah. have looked at where the plasma pause occurs in relation to those models and how that does does fit. But I haven't looked at the actual distance between where I'm getting peaked, uh, peak channel distributions and the plasma pause. So that's a level of granularity that I haven't really gone into much. Okay, cool. Yeah, it could be really helpful here. It organized his data really well. And since your pitch angle distributions are still mostly driven by the same wave particle interactions and waves that he was observing. It could be, it could help tease out a few more, a bit more about the physics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you again, Lewis, for a wonderful talk. Um, next week, we have our next Python tutorial in which we will be discussing, um, let me just get it up quick. Um, we will be having our next Python tutorial and it will be on the relationship between Python and C++ and Fortran and being able to compile those packages in Python. Um, so we hope to see everyone next week and we hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thank you again, Lewis. Thank you. Bye. Bye.